All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. So we stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, uh, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old has gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ and, has got, and God has given us uh, this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we might be made right with God through Christ. Well, as we begin today, we continue with this series called, series called You Make Me Crazy. And today, who you calling crazy? You calling me crazy? I mean, that's the, uh, the idea that sometimes we have to work through issues in our relationships, right? And uh, this is one that I spent seven hours with uh, six couples yesterday in pre-marriage seminar going through what it uh, means to resolve conflict. It's uh, one of my favorite topics. It's uh, something that's saved, uh, helped save our marriage. And it's one of the things that I've counseled with, with couples for many, many years. Uh, couples, individuals, uh, maybe uh, parents and kids, uh, uh, maybe with someone at work, uh, counseling people through all sorts of conflicted relationships. It's one of the essential skills, one of the essential skills that you'll need for relationships. So today, Backside of Your Bulletin is a great place. Take some notes. Listen, I hope you're not in, in conflict right now. But if you're not, you will be one day. So this is important information for you. At some point in your life, you'll need it. Whether you're rich or poor, uh, young or old, no matter the circumstances of your life, you'll need conflict resolution. And listen, your parents didn't teach this stuff to you because it's a, it's a concept that though it's in the Bible, and today I'm going to teach biblical principles, it's really something that we begin to understand more and more of from the Christian perspective in these last 20 to 30 years. And so um, I want to share some biblical concepts with you. And I love how the Bible is so honest. Listen to Romans 12, 7. It says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. As much as possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. I'm so glad that God didn't leave out that one section in there and just say, live at peace with everyone. God gives you a couple of caveats here. It says, as much as possible, as far as it depends on you. Now, you all know some crazy makers, right, that it's just almost impossible to have peace with. Don't look at them right now. But uh, you know that it can be difficult to get along with everyone all the time. But God wants us to try, but not just with our own efforts. God wants us to use, God wants us to use biblical principles, his word, his power in those relationships. And um, so today I want to take you through some things. The first of those things on the back of your bulletin is the damages caused by not repairing relationships, by not reconciling. Very quickly, just two of them, it blocks my fellowship with God. Blocks my fellowship with God. When I'm out of whack with you, I can't have harmony with God. 1 John 4.20 says, anyone who says, I love God and hates their neighbor is a liar. Wow, so don't let the crazy makers keep you from having harmony with God. Be reconciled. Secondly, it hinders my happiness. I can't be happy and in conflict at the same time. John 18.4 says, you are only hurting yourself. Job 18.4 says, you're only hurting yourself with your anger. If you want to find joy in life, learn to resolve conflict. So today, maybe the most important messages in this series, you make me crazy. Take notes, saddle, saddle up, and be ready to ride, because here we go. Let's take a look at some of these points. The first of those is to take initiative. Take initiative, and there are going to be four parts under the take initiative. Um, but taking initiative begins with uh, being a peacemaker. You don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them. It's about taking the initiative. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and mind, the Bible says, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love, love is a verb. Love is a verb. And that means action. It means taking initiative, doing something. And so I'm going to point out for you 
four ways of taking initiative in your relationship. And the first of these maybe looks like the opposite of taking initiative. But really, it's taking initiative as well. And that is to stop and cool off. You can't solve any conflict while you're, while you're hot. You can't solve any conflict while you're upset. The scripture says in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, but don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Anger gives a foothold to the devil. In our family, we like to say, take time, but within 24 hours, come back to the person who you're struggling with and have a conversation about it. You can't, uh, in the first couple of uh, moments, maybe even the first half hour or a few hours after a conflict, be ready to resolve it because your emotions get in the way. And so it's important to be able to recognize this first step of taking initiative as maybe the most vital for some of you. Some of you get stuck in this one, that you start yelling and screaming at each other before you, uh, be- before you even can get to listening to one another. And so, number one, stop and cool off. Remember, when your emotions are high, your ability to resolve conflict are low. Emotions are high, ability to resolve conflict are low. Secondly, uh, in, in taking initiative, you need to not ignore, don't ignore the problem. Don't ignore the conflict. What are you pretending right now that's not a conflict in your marriage? For those of you who are married, how about sex, money, the in-laws? Let's just get started. How about the kids? How about work? How about the work schedule? Any of those things ring a bell? Yeah, sure. Sometimes we just sweep them under the carpet. But the Bible says, as much as it depends on you, don't ignore. As much as it depends on you, take initiative. You know, when Marlos and I were first young in our marriage, I was, I was pretty bad at this one. Uh, there is this um, uh, Oliver Twist. You remember the book? I think there was a movie made out of it at some point. But there's this character called Ar- Artful Dodger. That's me, Artful Dodger. I mean, they wrote that character about me. She would come at me with an issue, and I would dodge it in some way. She'd come again, and I'd dodge it in another way. Uh, that's not helpful because no relationship is ever resolved by accident. So it, you heard the phrase, time heals everything? You ever heard that phrase, time heals everything? That's such a bunch of baloney, by the way. I mean, you know, if that were true, you could sit in the doctor's office and just keep waiting in the doctor's office and waiting, and suddenly you'd be better and never need to see the doctor at all, right? I mean, that's baloney, right? I mean, because, uh, in fact, time is the enemy sometimes. In fact, just the opposite. The longer you wait, the worse things get. You know, if you have an open sore, an open wound, and it festers, you can get gangrene. You can lose an arm. You can lose your life. Time does not heal everything. Conflict resolution can move you towards it. Uh, So anger can turn to resentment. Resentment can turn to bitterness. So we can't ignore. We can't ignore the conflict. Cool off. Don't ignore the conflict. And then be courageous. Be courageous to to enter into vulnerability with the person that you love. Be courageous. And it takes courage because none of us like to face conflict. And the only way to deal with conflict is to face it head on. You know, um, there's no phrase that puts fear more into a man than his wife saying, honey, we need to talk. You know, isn't that true? (laughs) That puts fear into, into any man. And if you think about uh, our fear of conflict, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, to Adam and Eve. In the Garden of Eden, Eden they blew it. They, uh, they sinned against God, and then God came to find them, to talk to them. And they were hiding. And here's what Adam said. He said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. When you think naked here, think vulnerable. Think exposed. Uh, He was fearful because he was being exposed. People fear conflict because they fear vulnerability. They fear being exposed in their life. And what's the first thing they did was to cover up. Why do we cover up? Because we fear conflict. We become distant. We like to hide. Uh, We become defensive. We start attacking. We become demanding. We want the last word. But cowards never resolve conflict. Only courageous people do. And where do we get that courage? The Bible says it comes from God. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 
God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. That middle word in there, love, it's important because the Bible also says, perfect love casts out fear. Love overcomes fear. It means that in relationships, we need to take initiative, be courageous, and be ready to be vulnerable, to expose the very person that we are, sins and all. Which brings us to the last part of taking initiative, which is that we need to choose the right time and a place. Timing is everything when it comes to resolving conflict. Even Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 5. He said, I, uh, if you're standing before the altar in the temple, giving an offering to God, and you suddenly remember someone has something against you, leave your offering there beside the altar. Go at once and first be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your gift to God. Wow. God says reconciliation takes priority over worship. So if some of you are taking off right before the offering today, I know where you're headed. You're going out to reconcile. But did you hear what it says? It says first leave your offering, so you aren't going to get out of that. All right, it means simply taking initiative, right? Jesus says you go, you take initiative. And it means also, timing means that you choose a time that works for both people, you, you and whoever is in conflict. Set a time that works when you're both at your best. When you're at your best. You might be ready to share the conflict. You might be ready to get going, but the other person's not. You know, I'm an extrovert. Mar- Marlis is an introvert. And, you know, there are times when, as an introvert, she needs to process. But as an extrovert, I'm ready to go. You know, I'm ready to talk this thing out. Because that's how I process is to talk it out. But we need to make sure that the time and the place is right for both people. Not only choose a time, but a place. A place that's uninterrupted by the kids, by the telephone, you know, by whatever, you know, machines that we have these days in our hands and pockets. Make sure that we're setting aside time in a place that works. And then I would say offer a prayer to God before you start. And say, God, help me to use the right words. And then come with an expectant feeling that God can do something to resolve the conflict and not you. It's God's power to resolve it. So we need to to take initiative. Let's just remember where we went. We talked about stopping and cool off, stop uh, stopping and cooling off. We talked about um, taking the initiative by being courageous, by choosing the right time and the right place, and by not ig- ignoring ignoring the conflict. Let's go on and and go to part two of conflict resolution. It means to listen and to speak. Notice the order of those: listen then speak. Listen, then speak. We, God gave us two ears and one mouth. You know, double the listening time, single the present. Hear that, extroverts, including me? You know, double the listen. Be, be quick to understand and, and, and slow to speak. The Bible says this in, first, in James chapter 1. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. And the first thing here to do is listen for the hurt. Listen for the emotion. You know, uh, anger, we talked about two weeks ago, is the secondary emotion. I get angry because I'm uh, feeling inadequate. I get angry because uh, I got criticized. I felt criticized. I get angry because I was disappointed. I'm angry because I'm frustrated, confused, hurt, sad, disappointed. Uh, a, A list of feelings. And by the way, there's a vocabulary of feelings. And uh, this was something that was introduced to me when we had been married for three or four years and I was struggling to figure all this out. I've left that vocabulary of feelings at the information centers today. You can pick one of those up and you might uh, learn some things about just the vocabulary of what's behind our anger. We get angry because we have this variety of jumble of feelings going on. And so we need to share those. We need to listen for those from our, our spouse, coworker, whoever we're talking to. And here's what I encourage couples at this point, is to actually just feed back the feeling. I hear you say, and then say the feeling. So I might say to my wife, I hear you say you're frightened when I'm driving, okay? And I hear you say you're embarrassed when I talk about you in a sermon, okay? We'll deal with that one after today. All right, so, you know, all of these things, that's just an example of how you feed back the feeling so that the other person, two things, Number one, they know you're listening. They know you heard it. 
And secondly, now you know what the problem is. So you can help be a part of the solution. But you can't be a part of the solution. You can't fix until you've heard the problem. Why? Because I don't want your help until you've heard them talk about their feelings, what's going on inside. And you're not ready to help because you really don't know what the problem is until you've heard their feelings. Listen to Romans 15 too. We must be considerate about the doubts and the fears of others. We must be considerate about the doubts and fears of others. Wow. Doubts, fears, feelings. Scripture tells us here we are to be listening for others. The, the second thing in listening is to consider the perspective. This is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. The Bible says in Philippians 2, each of you should look not only to your own interest, but the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. The word look there, you should look to the interest of others. That word look is the Greek word skopos. Skopos, like a microscope or a telescope, you should get a laser focus on the other person and not on yourself. The interest of others. You focus on their perspective just as God focuses on you and your needs. So God wants you to love others that way by focusing on them. And then the third thing about listening before you speak is that you have to finally speak. And when you speak, here's a good thing to do. Start off with confessing your part of the conflict. Hey, they may be 99.9% in the wrong. And that's what I always feel when people come to me. No, I'm kidding. They, uh, nine, they may be 99.9% .9 wrong, but you have to confess your 0.1% that's wrong. And if you want to resolve conflict, you better start with that. You better lead with that because it shows humility and vulnerability. But it takes two to tango, right? I mean, in any relationship, I have a part in. And so we start by confessing. Jesus talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? First, get rid of the log from your own eye. Then perhaps you'll see well enough to be able to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Ask yourself, was I ungrateful? Am I unrealistic? Have I been insensitive or oversensitive? Have I been too demanding in this relationship? Any two people can get along if they both grow up. Isn't that the problem? Is I'm not grown up? If, if, if I'm Terry Thruling, the first thing I want to do is to be self-indulgent, right? Think of myself. I don't think of you. Well, I, I do think of you some, but I mean, I, I don't think of you first. My sinful nature is to think of me and what I want. And so what I need to do in relationship where there's conflict is to confess that, examine myself, and say, what part have I brought to this relationship? And only after that do you then speak other words. I felt hurt when you said those words. I now lead with feeling statements. And notice, I statement, I feel embarrassed. I feel insulted. I feel saddened when this happens. So that's the listen and the speak. Again, remember the order. Listen, seek first to understand, then speak, seek next to, to be understood. The third one is to brainstorm some solutions. Uh, Ephesians 4.29 says this. It says, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. It also says speak the truth in love. So you want all of your words to be encouraging and helpful, but you also have to be truthful. You can't just say, oh, yeah, that'll work for me. I mean, sometimes you have to say, that doesn't work for me, but you want to say it in a loving way. And so at this point, when you're brainstorming solutions, you're thinking of all the ideas that could possibly work to solve this problem. And we like to say getting off the problem side and moving to the solution side, thinking win-win, everybody wins. How can we come up with solutions so that everybody wins? It's not so much compromise as it is to synergize, to take your energies, put them together, and come up with ideas that might just work for the two of you. And so you, you put down all ideas. Uh, corporations call this green lighting, that there's no bad answer at this point. You put them all down. The stupid idea, the, uh, the, the idea that I don't like, the idea that only I like, all of the ideas, and you write them down. And pretty soon, you know why you put them down? You put those down because they may lead to another answer that you hadn't thought of before. 
Sometimes the stupid one that makes you laugh suddenly frees you from the stress, and now the thoughts start flowing. Maybe one word that was said in there connected your brain to another idea, and suddenly the ideas are coming. You want a green light. No wrong idea. There's time to weed them out later. Right now, a green light. You may even put a little smiley face by them or a sad face if you don't like it or kind of an average face if it's okay so that you can later make some plans of which ones work and which ones don't. But here's the thing. You fix the problem, not the blame. Fix the problem, not the blame. Colossians 3.8 says this. But now is the time to get rid of anger, malice, rage, Malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. You know how to spell blame? Be lame. You know? I mean, if you fix blame, you're being lame. And it's it's time for us. We're getting to brainstorming. It's time for us to get on the solution side. It's time for us. We know how to hurt. It's time to drop the weapons of mass destruction. To stop using the D word if you're in a marriage. To begin thinking... How can we work together to solve this problem? And God desires us to do so. The idea is that we work towards unity, even in the midst of diversity. So we brainstorm some solutions. We start off by taking the initiative. We listen, then we speak. We brainstorm solutions. And finally, we choose the idea that brings us to reconciliation. You know, you need to choose from your brainstorm list maybe an idea or two or three, a combination of them that works because maybe not one of them is perfect. And you choose ideas that can draw you closer together because while you can't resolve every conflict, by the way, some of them are only ones that you can manage. You can't resolve them. So you can manage them together. You can disagree, but you can still be reconciled to each other because you're working together to manage it. If we uh, can't fully agree on an issue, we can still be reconciled together. One of the greatest things you can do in your life is to be a bridge builder. There's everybody building walls these days, but you can be a bridge builder. And you're going to be like Christ, you're going to be a reconciler. That scripture passage I read to start off this message today says this, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Our sin separates from God. And you know what God does while we're still far off? He comes to us. And he takes the initiative. He takes the the first step, makes the first move, and he comes to us. Before I even knew there was a problem, Jesus comes to us on a cross. He says, I love you. And he says, I'm here to reconcile you to my Father in heaven. God wants you to be a peacemaker. But you can't make peace with others until you've made peace with God. Scripture says in 1 Timothy, there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and people, and he is Jesus Christ. That's the starting point, to have peace. To be at peace, you need the Prince of Peace.